this video is brought to you by Adrenal Fatigue in a Can. This is the poll I put up. You may notice that there is a tiebreaker vote that has tilted it in favor of one option for what I talk about today. And today what I'm going to talk about by, well, three votes to two <laughs> is why old, slow, limited systems are better than today's modern systems, which feel like they have almost unlimited resources and an astonishing amount of power that even just 10 years ago, the biggest supercomputer in the world couldn't really fathom. The limitations that old, slow systems, ancient computers, old game consoles placed on the programmers, the artists, designers, all of the people involved in creating software products, and even in creating hardware products, those limitations made a huge difference. The reason that even today Nintendo and Super Nintendo games are considered to be highly collectible items, but even if you're not collecting the hardware, that they're just things that people, even new generations, are interested in playing, it's not because they have better graphics. I mean, arguably, <laughs> there's not really going to be much better graphics than we have today. You have computers, you have single graphics cards that can have 10 thousand sets of calculations running simultaneously, 10,000 at once. It, even on some of the biggest consumer level computers, you're still only talking about having 32 threads, you know, maybe more if you spend a whole lot of money. But it's not uncommon for a computer to have four cores and eight threads or more in their central processing unit today. Graphics cards are insanely heavily parallelized. They can do an amount of operations per second that is just mind-boggling. And then you look at something like the Nintendo Entertainment System, where the graphics system entirely consisted of tiles and sprites. Now, for those of you who are not old enough or technically aware enough or whatever to know what tiles and sprites are, or if you just need a recap. A tile is where you carve the screen up into a grid and this box with this grid in it, each square in that grid is a tile. They call it a tile because it's laid out like a tile in a bathroom. Instead of drawing every single dot, every single color, what you do is in memory somewhere you have what you want to go there already laid out and then you tell the graphics chip hey this section of memory where I've stored this graphic over here that's what I want to show in this tile and that's how the screen was built you literally it was like if you took graph paper and you took itty bitty little partial drawings like take the drawing you want like the screen you want and you sliced it into little tiny pieces and any pieces that were identical, you threw away all the extras and just had one. And instead of having those pieces, you have a number that refers to like a list of those pieces. That is exactly how the NES graphics worked. <clears throat> and then, on top of that, you had sprites. Sprites were kind of like tiles, except they're defined separately and they move around the screen independently and they have transparency. So it's like having a couple of tiles combined where you're allowed to specify that you can see through parts of them and the X and Y for where you want the top left corner to be. In this way, you can draw, you know, Mario and, you know, Goombas, bullets, anything that needs to move around independently of the pre formed tile setup that you've got, you would use these sprites to move it around. And a lot of early computers especially, um, and game consoles, used this methodology. You had tiles and you had sprites. Now, that isn't entirely true. Like, for example, the Commodore 64, the Commodore has sprites, and it has a text mode system that essentially is tile-based in that the system font is just a set of tiles. 
<clears throat> but what it what it is not, and hang on, and because I keep coughing, and I know y'all love the coughing, but I think the pollen is what's causing me to cough 24 hours a day. By the way, um, this video is brought to you by Adrenal Fatigue in a Can. Ugh, I'm dead. Anyway, the Commodore would use sprites, but it didn't use tiles for most games. They, uh, they would use bitmaps, or they would use an interrupt trick where when the raster hit a certain vertical line, once it hit that line, it would fire off a trigger, an alarm of sorts. They call it an interrupt. It's just, it's an interrupt. And <clears throat> that interrupt would say, hey, look, I'm at raster line 120 or whatever. Uh, what do you want to do? And the interrupt code would go, oh, it's at 120. We'll flip to text mode. And then when it would get to the vertical blanking interval where it cycles back up to the beginning of the screen, that part would switch back to bitmapped mode. In this way, they could like split the screen so that the bottom or the top or whatever was rendered in text mode, which meant that you could use what would have been the bitmap memory for something else. But I'm getting a bit off topic. The point is that these limitations forced programmers to be more creative. They forced programmers to write better, tighter, faster, more elegant, uh, more well thought out, more clever in some cases, code than they otherwise would have. Optimization was basically required. You had to write good code. You couldn't just write a bunch of crappy code because a 1 megahertz 6502 processor is just not going to be able to keep up. I mean, even just the most basic tasks. Let me, let me just put it this way. <clears throat> the 6502 in the Commodore 64. And I, I, I grew up learning to program the Commodore, even though technically, you know, the Commodore... It, I, won't, I don't want to say it was before my time. It wasn't before my time. But when the Commodore came out, um, I was in the baby range. So... Home computers, modern, the most modern home computers at the time um, that I popped out the womb, and, or not what popped out, but you know, when I was like six, seven, eight, about the age where you can start learning about this kind of stuff, home computers had already advanced into the 16 bit era. But you know what? A lot of people don't grow up having access to the latest and greatest pieces of hardware. So, yep, we had a Commodore 64 with a bunch of video games and some practical programs. And that was it. That, that was all we got. So that's what I learned. I read the user manual. I learned how to program it. And one of the things that I learned was how to do bitmap graphics. Now, part of doing bitmap graphics is you have to clear the memory that the bitmap is going to use. <clears throat> and normally what would happen for, like, an assembly language demo, just as an example... Keep in mind, assembly language is as fast as it gets. You're never going to get anything faster than assembly language. It's just not going to happen because that's the lowest language of the computer. That's what the processor natively understands. It's analogous to machine code. You get the idea. In assembly language, the 8 kilobyte, technically 8,000 byte, section of the bitmapped graphics area that you set up the 1 megahertz processor, 8-bit, which means it could write to 8 bits of the 8, 8, you know, 8, every write was 1 byte, 8 bits. It could write 8 pixels to a monochrome bitmap screen at one time for every single processor operation. It was so slow that the demo program will have you flip the VIC-2 into bitmap mode and then clear the screen. Well, if you flip it into bitmap mode, you see what was already there. You can actually see other programs do this too. It's not just the demo programs that these manuals told you to write. It, my point is it was so slow that you could actually watch as your fill routine that fills it with zeros, which is a very fast operation, by the way. You're not even copying memory. You load a zero into the accumulator. You fire off this loop with the index registers, and that's basically it. You just keep cycling. Boom, 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 boom. And even though it's about the fastest memory write operation you can perform um, in sequence, the problem is you could still see it wipe. Like, it didn't take a full second 
But boy, you could watch that line go from top to bottom as it cleaned out the garbage on the screen and left you with a nice empty canvas for you to practice your primitive, super slow programming skills upon. So this, this bitmap graphics wiping stuff, I mean, that's the point, is it couldn't even update the screen at more than a few frames a second if all it was doing was wiping it out or direct copying without any kind of clever code, without any intelligence at all, really. So if you've got a computer that is really that slow that it can't even update the screen more than a couple times a second if you're doing a whole screen, <coughs> you have to get clever. You have to figure out better ways to do things. I'm going to try and make this brightness go down a bit for you. Hang on. All right. You have to get better at this stuff. God, this, of course the sun comes out right in the middle of a damn video. Well, if I'm blown out, so be it. Um, you, you would find that programmers would often split screen um, on a certain raster line so that they could switch to text, not only because it meant you'd have more RAM to work with to store other stuff relevant to the game or whatever, um, but also because less bitmapped area means that you can update that smaller window faster. In fact, if you saw games where like there was a text bar at the top and a bunch of text at the bottom, on the Commodore 64 in particular, that was the reason why. It, it wasn't because they were like, oh, this is a great design decision. I can't wait to, you know, use the stock computer font that literally you see all the time with this machine and therefore has no identity or character of its own outside of the machine itself. I can't wait to use the stock font to put a bunch of not colorful or particularly interesting text at the top and bottom of the screen for my creative vision, my interactive computer program with interesting graphics and all this other stuff. Oh, I can't wait for that. No, nobody said that. Nobody did that because it was stupid. You did it because you had to do it. You did it because it's hard. It's hard on a machine that is so incredibly, and today almost unfathomably slow at shuffling bytes around that you couldn't even update a screen fast enough for people to play an action game that was full screen without doing stuff like that. You'd have to carve off windows of the screen and go, we're not gonna update this ever. That's why you saw a lot of Commodore and other early computer games that would have like little sections of the screen that they would change and a bunch of other sections that would never change or that would rarely change, that you just, you'd never see anything different because you have to make those sacrifices on an old limited machine. Now, you're probably sitting back at this point since I've blabbed for, God, I don't even remember where the timer is on my thing, but it looks like 15 minutes, and all I've really gotten to is like, oh, the Commodore had all these limitations, so they had to make all these shitty decisions that frankly don't sound really good. Jody, what are you talking about? Why have you spent 15 minutes on this? Well, because these limitations force the programmers to make their games interesting in other ways. If you do not have the graphics, if you do not have the sound, they did not have digitized sound back then. To get digitized sound out, there was a method by which you could modulate a one-bit pulse channel on the SID chip to get voices or whatever out. It sounded awful. I mean, you want to talk about bad. This synthesized speech was bad back in the day. You could make sounds with it, but you had to turn off the video chip because if you didn't, then the video chip interrupts would actually cause the sound to come out wrong. I mean, it was bad. You, you had no PCM audio. It was all, hey, I want you to play these beeps and boops. And you could do a lot of neat things with the beeps and boops, but the bottom line is that it was still beeps and boops. So you didn't have the sound, you didn't have the graphics, you didn't have the speed to make all kinds of fancy AI decisions. You know, you couldn't calculate physics. You, you couldn't like do pathfinding in any amazing way to calculate thousands of possible chess moves to do some clever thing in a chess game. You just couldn't do that. You had basically for your game logic, you were pretty much guaranteed that the vertical blanking interval was where you could do the most heavy stuff, but Otherwise, you had an extremely limited amount of time to make this stuff happen. So you had to cut things back to the essentials. You did not have a choice. 
So your gameplay had to be on point. You had to absolutely smash that bitch right out of the park. Or your game was going to suck. And it was going to suck bad. Look, it got darker again. Of course it got darker again. Your game was going to suck because, well, <laughs> if you try to make it look pretty, it can't be fast. And if you try to make it look fa go fast, it can't be pretty. The limitations force the game designers to make their games good in ways that you're not forced to today. Today, you can make massive worlds, open worlds, I mean, just, just giant closed worlds that feel open because they're so huge. You have an almost unlimited amount of room that you can put things. You have this, this just seemingly unlimited tank of video memory, textures, whatever. <coughs> you, can, you can lay out an entire enormous world of things. You can create thousands and thousands of characters. And what can you do with them? Well, I mean, depending on how much manpower you throw behind the game, it could still be a really good game. But what's stopping them? What's stopping them from making a terrible game? And I think that the answer is nothing. There's nothing stopping them short of market forces, and unfortunately, market forces largely have allowed a lot of really crappy things to be made these days. And, like, look at what the internet has done, for example. The internet, I, I, now, I'm going to be clear, the internet's a wonderful thing. You know, God bless it, I love the internet. It, it revolutionized the world. But I hate the internet, because the internet made it so that now, when you publish a game, the the near guarantee that the vast majority of your customer base is going to have internet connectivity means A, you can make a shitty, like, always connected sort of thing, which you can use for all sorts of anti-customer things like anti-piracy, which can really, if it hiccups, end up making it so they can't play their game, uh, run their software, whatever, you know. This guarantee of internet connectivity also means that you can put out a garbage product and go, eh, patch it later. We'll, 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 we'll fix it later. We'll get it in good running condition later. Right now, we just need to get it out the door. We've just got to shit something out that the customers will buy and give us more money, and then we'll make a half-assed attempt later at making it not suck. And um, you can point to the, at this point, I feel pretty well-known story of No Man's Sky and say, <clears throat> yeah, No Man's Sky, they they put out a shitty product at the beginning and then they spent years making it not shitty and they, they basically delivered on that promise. The sun is really heavy today. Um, but they're a, probably the rarest exception and that's why I know about them because I don't really play games much anymore. But they are, they are very, very much an exception to the rule here. They are not typical. You're never going to see like Adobe or Microsoft take their shitty products and make them better. They're going to put out shitty products. They're going to cram more features in because now everything is features all the damn time because you live in this perpetual cycle of, well, they'll fix it one day. I'm sure they'll fix it one day. I'll live with how shitty the product is because they'll fix it one day. If you didn't have internet connectivity and you were stuck with it, you wouldn't feel that way. You'd be calling the manufacturer going, I want a damn refund for this piece of utter garbage that you sold me for $100. Screw you. No, I don't want your product. No, I'm not going to trust your company in the future because you've made a garbage product and you put it out and you took my money and what you gave me wasn't worth my money. But you see, back in the day they couldn't do this. Not only was it not internet connected, but they were limited in what they could do. Every limitation on what you can do forces you to think better, to do better, to make something that overcomes those limitations. And it's the act of iterating over the things you want to do, throwing out what it is that you can't do or sacrificing some of the things you wanted to do. Basically, you were forced to spend more time, more effort, more testing, whatever, on your product. You had to do better because once you shipped that product, you could not get it back. You weren't going to be able to pick up the phone and go, oh, hey, 
this 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 isn't working right, man. This 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 product that we shipped, it's trash. Um, okay, we need to send out an update. You guys need to work on an update. Get it done quick. Oh, okay. You know that wasn't going to happen. Customers would buy it. It would be trash. Customers would not buy from you anymore. Customers would go, that game company puts out trash. That software company puts out trash. And they would never buy from you again. Nowadays, it's perpetual updates. But, you know, that, that's, that kind of falls back into the internet side of it. But it's the combination of having to put out a final product rather than an, an eternal beta version, or even eternal alpha version, it's not even really production ready, but they just perpetually just shove it out there, just shit it out. You know, you get the idea. I don't have to keep harping on that point. The limitations forced you to put out a polished final product, which meant that you had to spend more time polishing. And the more polished something is, the better it's going to be. The better it's going to do what it set out to do. And being forced to eliminate things because you have limitations means that some things that aren't that great, because A, you're spending more time on it, B, you're looking at it with a more critical eye, C, you don't have a choice but to throw some things away, you're going to pick the worst things. And what you end up with, much like if you take iron ore and you smelt it and you take off the slag that floats to the top, what you end up with is a pure, finished product, something that it, it is the essence of what you were going for. It is all of the good things and very little of the bad left. There might be a few bits of that crust on the outside, but your final product is something that you can be proud of, something that people feel is worth their money, time, and attention. And it's all because you had limitations. You had these things that would say no. I don't care if you want to be able to do this. I don't care what you want. It doesn't matter what you think or what you want or what resources you wish existed or whatever. It doesn't matter. The reality is that guy has a Nintendo or a Commodore or an Atari or uh, whatever sitting at home. <coughs> he has a product. You have a product that you're trying to sell him. He does not have your big friggin' development system. You know, he doesn't have the Vax mainframe that's in the back that you use to actually write and make all your software. He doesn't have, like, he doesn't have this fancy, like, true color graphics display that cost an insane amount of money in the 80s to, to have a monitor that could do that kind of thing. Even close to that. You know, everything was 16 colors in the 80s. Uh, or worse. And... The, the end consumer doesn't have that. It doesn't matter what your vision is. You have to fit your vision within the limitations of practical reality. And with computers developing to the point that they have absurd, just exponential, skyrocketing, high amounts of power, everything in a modern computer is so powerful. I mean, I, I have a Ryzen 9 with a GeForce, what the hell, RTX 3080 or something, and 64 gigs of RAM, and a, a huge fast SSD, and blah, 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 blah. And some game designer somewhere today could be, like, if that became the norm, then some game designer would be like, oh, I can write this really shitty um, you know, who cares about optimization? Don't think about any of that. Just prototype it as fast as possible thing, and I can make that the game. Or I can make that the word processor, or whatever it is. It doesn't matter what it is. That's why you see languages like Python being so popular today. Because even though they might be a hundred to a thousand times slower than C, C++, whatever, these languages that are super slow and really complicated and bloated and just they're faster to prototype in you know they're they're bloated and slow but they're faster to prototype in and oh everybody has fast computers now so we don't have to even care about <clears throat> like making a polished product just oh we're, we're, we're under a deadline we got a time constraint y you made a prototype oh well the prototype is the final product now because we just don't have time we don't have time for you to polish it everybody's got 
four gigs, I mean eight gigs of RAM now. Everybody, everybody has, you know, like 50 gigs of hard drive, I mean 100, I mean 600 gigs of hard drive space available. Everybody has, you know, two cores, I mean four cores, I mean, I mean eight cores available on their computer now. Everybody has, you know, uh, 720p, I mean 1080p screens on their computer now. So just don't, don't worry about making it work on these resource constrained systems. You know, that guy that's got that Celeron laptop, screw him. <coughs> he needs to spend more money on a better computer because we, we just don't have time. We, we, we just we just don't have time. If you if you want to use our product, just get a better computer. Why, why, why are you stuck in the past, bro? Why are you using old brick to do computing, bro? You know, why are you still on an abacus when, when you could have like a, a, a 3D abacus, bro? Uh, and, and that's the way that things have evolved. We, everything is a fucking prototype. Everything is basically just trash because there's no limitations anymore. There are no restrictions. Software is a gas that expands to fit its container, to fill its container. And dev machines are notoriously powerful. You don't see developers testing most of their software on something like the Wise Thing Client laptop that I picked up recently. You don't see them grabbing a 12-year-old computer and going, but how does it work on this? Because all of these smug, techno-weenie software developers think that if you're not running a solid-state drive in 2023, you must be a fucking moron. You must be an out-of-touch old Luddite who is never going to run their product anyway. You, you must just be, there must be something wrong with you because we're, we're smug bastards. You know, we wrote, we, if we can write this software for you on these big powerful machines, why can't you afford, you know, why can't you afford like an i3 uh, or whatever? What is it that makes you unable to do this? <clears throat> and it's sort of this, this attitude where the prototype becomes the final product. Everything just needs to be done as fast as possible, regardless of how good it is that has pervaded the entirety of our society. And that is why I have extreme reverence, why I look at old machines with this sort of, like, this nostalgic lust. And I, I have to finish up pretty soon, but the bottom line is that there's this war on nostalgia, and I've always wondered why. It always seemed kind of weird to me that um, certain people, usually, like, um, progressive -y types or just there's always these smug bastards that are like get with the modern times um, but I noticed over the past decade the rise of the assault on nostalgia <clears throat> but it wasn't until I listened to some video recently um, that I really realized why there's an assault on nostalgia why nostalgia is mocked why people who look at the past and go, yeah, that was actually better, are called all kinds of nasty things like reactionaries or man babies or, you know, adult children. You know, why can't you grow up and, and get with the modern shitty times, bro? And the reason that there's a war on nostalgia is because the nostalgia, the things from the past, you've got to stop paying attention to them because if you don't, You'll realize how shitty things are in the present, and you might actually do something about it. You might not buy big corporates' products. You might you might not let them run you over like this. You might actually expect to be able to own things. You might expect your your IP cameras to be usable without an internet connection. You might expect your washing machine to work without signing up for an LG account or something. You might expect your TV to function without the internet. You know, you might not let them abuse you because you can see that in the past that even though the products still had a lot of the same stresses as today, the one thing they couldn't do was put out a shitty product that, that you didn't own. Put out a shitty product, you know, blah, blah, blah. The limitations forced them <clears throat> to put out good stuff. Even mediocre stuff was better than what we would consider mediocre today. And the entire reason for that is because now they can make all these assumptions that you have infinite computing power and an always-on high-speed internet connection so they don't have to do anything to give a crap about what they're putting in your pocket or putting in your hand in exchange for the money in your pocket. It's a shameful state of affairs. So yes, I revere old computers. I revere things that can do things, do real work, get things accomplished without being tied to cloud accounts and, and cloud storage and all that. 
because those things come from an era and they sort of still live in an era where you actually owned your stuff and people had to actually make good stuff and products weren't shit yet because everything didn't force you to be a slave to Amazon or some other stupid cloud provider or company that forced you to patch stuff. Anyway, I'm about to go into a grocery store, so um, I'll talk to you later. Thanks for watching. You know the drill. Like, comment, subscribe. Don't party too hard, bros.